Um, also wanted to make one statement that's important to uh, convey to you, and that was conveyed to us by one of the, the um, registrants here, is that uh, an individual has found the prostate MRI to be of major advantage in her practice, and she said that we should spread the word that we are the place that offers that, because um, th they've tried to uh, you know, find this elsewhere, that fusion-targeted MR. Uh, ultrasound biopsy is uniquely available at UT Southwestern, uh, so just there for your knowledge, and we're proud of that uh, to offering. Okay, so the second session will start, and uh, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Andra Blumkons, who is Professor and Vice Chair of Academic Affairs and Business Development in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Her experience includes basic laboratory and clinical research with a focus on cardiovascular disease, obesity, and dietary influences on health and disease. Her presentation is entitled, Deep Vein Thrombosis and Pulmonary Embolism, When is a D-Dimer Enough? Good morning. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today, and thank you to Drs. Brewington and Pedrosa for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'm an emergency physician with the Department of Emergency Medicine at UT Southwestern, and my practice is predominantly at Clements University Hospital. I'll be talking with you about venous thromboembolism, and specifically how to incorporate D-dimer in your imaging plans. First of all, I have a few disclosures with a few companies of which, uh, for which I get research funds, but I will not be discussing any specific assays or therapeutics today. So we all assess risk every day. Every time we get into the car, we're assessing and mitigating risks. We put on our seatbelt, we decide to drive or not drive the speed limit, we decide or not decide to answer the phone. And all these things we inherently know either increase or decrease risk. And the cornerstone for VTE diagnosis is assessing risk. And unfortunately, we can never get to the point of no risk but the idea is to put people in different categories, and that might be low, medium, or high risk. And why do we do this? Because risk factors, we've all been taught, can lead to a small clot, which can lead to a big clot, which can lead to PE, which can lead to death. And the important thing to realize is that risk factors don't equal death, that there are several things along the way that we can use to help us in this diagnosis. So there are several things we've been taught to use in the past, right vital signs, classically tachycardia or hypotension, the ECG, particularly right heart strain, uh, the ABG, which has fallen more out of favor since we have so many people now with interstitial lung disease, chest x-ray, compression ultrasound, and then D-dimer, and then the following scores. I'll be discussing three specific scores and how to best use them. And then when those, you have those scores, whether or not to proceed to angiography or other imaging studies. So no talk about VTE would be complete without some kind of inspection of the intrinsic coagulation pathway. True, uh, but that's all we're gonna do today. So if you, feel, if you feel cheated by that, I'm happy to discuss this with you outside the consultation room. So our first patient of the day is Mr. Earl. Mr. Earl is 58, has a few risk factors, smoked a little bit in his youth, and comes in with shortness of breath and chest pain. And to make it interesting, his shortness of breath is moderate, and his chest pain is both heavy and sharp. Those are his uh, vital signs. He's a little tachycardic, a little more hypoxic than you'd expect. He just had a very successful knee replacement, was moving very quickly, is doing physical therapy, and is at home, but he does come in with a right swollen leg. So, We'll pause for a moment and say, okay, D-dimer. Is standalone D-dimer enough? Can it just be incorporated right away during morning labs or out in triage for a complaint? And the answer is really no. The negative predictive value of a D-dimer can fall as low as 78% if not incorporated with clinical features. So we'll be going through the following clinical decision rules. I have asterisks next to the last two because there are also simplified versions of those specific rules. I personally use MD-Calc. It's a free online um, 
risk calculator of a bunch of different scores. There are several of these. I prefer to have those rather than uh, memorize each and every one of the scores. The very nice thing about MDCalc is that it also talks to you about when the score is most appropriate, pearls and pitfalls of the score, and then also um, the supporting literature. So, Mr. Earl, so Wells score for DVT. These are the risk factors for DVT. Each of these gives you one point, for the exception of the last one, which gives you negative two points. So these are all things we've learned before, cancer, bedridden, swollen calf, painful leg, immobilization. Um, previously documented DVT comes in over and over again in all the scores. So if you previously had a venous thromboembolism, you're already at high risk. And the key with the Bell scores, both for DVT and PE, it has a subjective component, and that is its number one criticism. Alternative diagnosis is likely or more likely than DVT, and everyone kind of interprets that a little bit differently. So if we go back to Mr. Earl, we'll say that depending on what his exam shows, he probably has up to about four points. And if we have up to four points, that puts him in moderate risk. So if you have a score of zero, the risk of DVT is very low. Moderate risk, you can use a D-dimer, and this is a perfect use of a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is negative, you can feel very good that the chance of him having a DVT is less than 1%. If the score is higher than that, however, his risk is much higher, and the D-dimer is less useful. However, if the D-dimer is positive, you consider treatment. However, if it's negative, you might want to consider repeating the test. So the thing to think of is that high risk, sort of no matter what the D-dimer shows, you may have to do another test later down the road. But if the, in the low or moderate risk, D-dimer is enough. So let's go back to Mr. Earl. This is different Mr. Earl, this is his twin brother Earl. And uh, he has slightly different complaint today with all the same risk factors, except he is, has pl uh, pleuritic right-sided chest pain. So clearly we're concerned about a PE. So there are three rules for PE. The PERC rule by Je Jeff Klein out of Indiana is, this is a rule out set of rules. You can't have any of these. If you have any one of these, you don't perk out, and that's the, the term, perking out, uh, and uh, you have to proceed to some other type of test, in this case, D-dimer. So if we think about Mr. Earl, he misses several of these. He's over 50, his heart rate's up over 100, his SAT's too low, he has had recent surgery, so he, you can't use PERC with him. You've, you gotta, you've gotta go to something next, in this case it would be D-dimer. We'll cover Wells' criteria for pulmonary embolism, and just like Wells' criteria for uh, DVT, there's a subjective component, and some people are comfortable with that and others are not. You'll also notice that each of these has perhaps a slightly different amount of score or a degree of score. The simplified version makes them all one, but uh, this is the one most supported by the literature, and you add those up. There are two different approaches for this. One's three-tier, one's two-tier, but basically it's still the same. You're assessing risk. If the patient's score is low, in this case less than two, D-dimer negative, stop. You don't need any more imaging. Moderate or high risk, use D-dimer. If it's negative for moderate risk, stop. If positive, CTA. But if high risk, D-dimer should not be helpful to you. If the patient is truly high risk for having VTE, consider imaging. The two-tier approach just breaks it down into two different things. So this is the Geneva score. It is the revised Geneva score, and it's revised because the original one had an ABG and a chest X-ray in it. So this is the revised version, which is now commonly used. There's also a simplified revised version, um, which I'm not going to discuss. Same kind of thing. The tricky thing is a lot of these have slightly different ages in there. Sometimes it's 50, sometimes it's 55, sometimes it's 65. Previous DVT or PE always puts you in a higher risk category. Um, surgery, particularly under general anesthesia, is considered a risk factor. And then many of the other things we've already discussed, and I'll discuss cancer separately here in a couple slides. So once again, you get your score, 
You use, hopefully, some sort of tool, or even better, it's already incorporated in your electronic health record as part of your ordering profiles. Low risk, D-dimer, you're done. Intermediate risk, D-dimer, you're done. D-dimer positive, and remember, thinking PE at this point, so you'd go to T, uh, CTA. And then if the CTA is inconclusive, VQ. Uh, high score greater than 11, it basically go to imaging. So the key kind of consistent feature with all these scores, um, particularly Wells and Geneva, is if the person is high risk, D-dimer is not helpful to you. If the person is truly high risk based on those criteria, not just gestalt, but those criteria, um, move to imaging. I want to make a plug for age-adjusted D-dimer. Uh, this is uh, from a, a nice article, JAMA 2014, that basically says, okay, if the normal threshold for the high sensitivity D-dimer is 500 nanograms per mil, you can actually add to that for every decade above 50. So somebody who is six, who's 60 might have 600, 70, 700. And this actually helps decrease the amount of imaging because as people age, their D-dimer tends to be more elevated. And this approach is very well supported in the present literature. So case number two, Mr. Rick, he's 38, unfortunate gentleman, has lung cancer, is undergoing all the treatments, so he has active cancer, but he's very functional and he's coming in with chest pain. It used to be such that people thought, gosh, cancer, super high risk, go right to imaging. And that's not the case. These same tools we use, Wells, Geneva, PERC, can all work with patients with other specific conditions, specifically cancer. So cancer alone shouldn't bring you to CTA. Cancer with other factors, like the things in Wells and Geneva, could bring you to CTA. Now, D-dimer, if it's negative, it's negative, and you're in good shape. You don't have to worry anymore. But unfortunately, as we all know, sometimes, or not sometimes, but 80% of the times, it, it's positive. So just doing a CT based on just de novo active cancer is really not appropriate. The patient should have those same clinical decision rules used. Last patient, Rachel, 32, pregnant, about 32, uh, 38 weeks, and she's got two kids at home. Shortness of breath, tachycardia, which is new for her, and she presents with the following vital signs that could be even normal in her stage of pregnancy. So this is a very vexing problem, and the diagnosis and then even treatment of VTE in patients who are pregnant is particularly problematic because we have additional uh, risks with exposure to radiation, exposure to contrast media, and then also risks with treatment. So this is uh, slightly more difficult to assess. And it's been studied extensively, and there still are no specific rules. However, it suggests that the clinical decision rules that we use already uh, can be very effective. Although you'll notice that none of those previous rules did they mention pregnancy, and that's because pregnancy is excluded from all of those studies. So pregnancy is still a little bit of a question. So we all know that VTE is higher in pregnancy, but overall it's still low because for the general population, particularly the healthy population, it's very low. It increases with every trimester, and it persists even up to three months afterwards, and it's higher in the later trimesters. And D-dimer can be elevated by itself. So there are been many studies about trying to establish a D-dimer threshold for pregnancy and whether or not you can say, okay, we're done. And that is absolutely not the case. There is no D-dimer threshold that is currently safe to say a patient does not have, a pregnant patient does not have VTE. This is one approach uh, that Jeff Klein has recommended. That's the maker of the PERC rule on how to work through somebody who you feel as though may have a PE. And that is essentially you do uh, Geneva or Wells first. Notice it also says clinical gestalt, but let's say on Geneva or Wells first, if it's low risk, you do PERC. If PERC is negative, you don't even have to do a D-dimer at that point. You're done. So Wells, Geneva, and then PERC, you're done. Moderate risk, you're really relying on D-dimer to help you move forward. High risk, you're pretty much going to imaging, and depending on your situation, you may even start treatment. So for the future, I see lung ultrasound perhaps coming into some of our uh, diagnostics for VTE, and then that we're still looking for this mystical kind of D-dimer threshold and perhaps some other marker for pregnancy. 
In overall summary, D-dimer is not a standalone diagnostic tool. It should be used with clinical decision rules. Uh, the D-dimer is best when it is negative, that is its inherent value. It's okay to use the age-adjusted D-dimer, and I would recommend that. And special pa patient populations, for instance, cancer and even pregnancy, can benefit from a combination clinical decision and D-dimer um, strategy. Thank you so very much for your time.